So this morning's message is for the parents and the step parents and the grandparents that might be here with us this morning. Because I want to talk to you about the world that your children live in today. It's changed quite a bit from when I was a child. When you were a child. But we all still have to serve somebody. I don't know. I'm probably, well, Jillian's got me beat by a couple of years, but we're, we're the oldest probably here today, so we've seen quite a few generations of change through the decades that our children have had to grow up in and how the world has changed. You know, there was a time that uh, we would say, home sweet home. But the home has changed quite a bit since then. You know, home sweet home meant a place where there was comfort and there was peace. And it was a place of family togetherness. You know, the entire family would get together. It was a place to sleep. It was a place to rest. You know, home was a safe place. Well, like I said, the world has changed in the homes that our children grow up in has changed. So today there's even large populations that don't even have a home, you know, the homeless. And you've got illegal aliens leaving their homes behind them and coming to America by the thousands and thousands every day, you know, trying to start a new life here in America. And there are so many single family homes in America today, which has given rise to the term latchkey kids. You know, these are kids that, you know, after spending an entire day at school, they come home and there's nobody there. It's their parent or their parents have to work. So they come home to an empty house. And I don't think that we as parents and grandparents and step-parents spend much time thinking about the world that our children are growing up in and how it has changed since we were their age. So I'm going to give you an example of some of the changes. And these examples I'm giving you based upon my own experience, but maybe you can identify with them. So I'm going to begin in the 40s. Now, I wasn't a child in the 40s, but I was born at the end of the 40s. Like I said, I'm 71 pretty soon. But the kids in the 40s grew up with World War II. And a lot of the kids, their father was overseas in the war. And a lot of times fathers didn't come home. And homes back then had an ice box. They didn't have a refrigerator and the milk was delivered door to door. And a kid could attend a Saturday matinee for only a dime and families, they got together in the evening and they listened to the radio. And before they went to bed, there was a lot of togetherness in the family. And kids in the 50s, they grew up with black and white televisions. And there was Howdy Doody and Lassie and the Lone Ranger and the Ed Sullivan Show. And of course we had those Saturday morning cartoon marathons. As soon as you get up, you watch cartoons until one, two o'clock in the morning, not morning, but in the afternoon when your parents would kick you out of the house. And each night the television programming would end with the Star Spangled Banner before they went dark. And kids spent all of their times outdoors playing with the other kids unless it was raining. And back then we captured life's moments on cameras that were filled with film that you had to take down to the drugstore somewhere and get it developed before you could see what you actually took a picture of. And kids back in the 50s spent hours mastering the art of the hula hoop and how to get that slinky to go down the stairs without getting all tangled up. Teens listen to 45 RPM records. A lot of people don't even probably know what a 45 RPM record is. And they fell in love with the music of a teenager from Tupelo, Mississippi by the name of Elvis Presley. 
And there was fear of a third war, a third world war with Russia back then. So kids were taught to hide under their desk in the event of a nuclear bomb. Like that was going to protect them. <laughs> you were there. Kids in the 60s, they were introduced to color television. But of course, you still had to get up to change the channel. You had to get up to play with that little coat hanger that served as the <laughs> antenna. Yeah. You know, on Saturday mornings, the kids watched the Dick Clark American Bandstand. Yeah. And they knew the words to all the Beatles songs. And if kids wanted money, well, they could get money through an allowance if they did some chores around the house. An allowance just wasn't something you automatically got every week. <laughs> you know, telephones had rotary dials and we had party lines. I remember getting on the phone, you'd, you hear the other party line on the phone, so you would have to hang up and wait for them to finish their phone call. Jesus on the main line. Jesus was on the main line. He didn't have party lines unless you were part of the party. The families, they actually ate dinner together and they ate and they talked face to face. They didn't have a telephone in front of them while they were talking to you. But the world was changing. And many of our young people back then started getting hooked on drugs and LSD. And there were assassinations. Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, there was free love and schools began to become integrated and there was racial hatred and violence in the streets. You know, kids that were graduating from high school in the 60s, they, they didn't know what their future was going to be because waiting for them was the draft in Vietnam. Had to see if they were going to get through Vietnam before they could decide if they even had a future. Kids in the 70s, they grew up with Charlie's Angels and Disco and Happy Days and MASH, Saturday Night Fever and the Bee Gees. <laughs> we haven't had any Bee Gees worship songs. They spent less time outside, they spent more time inside, and they were playing Atari. Things like Donkey Kong and Mario Brothers. They watched Little House on the Prairie and the Adams Family. Family shows. It was okay if the kids didn't wear a helmet while they were riding their bicycle. Nobody seemed to die. But back in the 70s, it became mandatory that cars had seat belts. You had to put on that seatbelt on the long annual trip to Grandma's house. And hopefully get there without your father having to pull off the road and come back there and take care of business. Yeah. Neighborhoods were safe back in the 70s. And it was okay for a kid to go trick-or-treating back then by themselves without an entourage of parents following them down the street. And we would stay out to nine or ten o'clock ringing doorbells and it was okay kids in the 80s they grew up in an era of crack cocaine and aids you know there was mtv and Pee Wee herman and the teenage mutant ninja turtles nintendo nightmare on elm street and if you were away from home and you needed to call somebody, all you had to do is have a few dimes and quarters and find a telephone booth. There were telephone booths back then. Parents could tell their kids to run to the store and pick up a pack of Marlboros, and the clerk at the store wouldn't even ask a question. It was okay back then. And parents still disciplined their their children and the concept of spare the rod and spoil the child was considered reasonable and totally acceptable. And the new hangout for kids back in the 80s was shopping malls. Shopping malls began to spring up. And learning about the birds and the bees was pretty easy. The 
because there were only two sexes back in the 80s. Because that's the way God created us. In fact, there were gender-specific classes in the schools. You know, only the girls could take home economics, only the guys could take shop. And movies began to get ratings. Uh, before the 1984, there was no thing as a PG-13 movie. And when kids weren't in school, parents would kick them out of the house and told them you can't come back until it's either dark or dinner, whichever came first. But they were safe. They were safe in their neighborhoods. Kids in the 90s, they grew up with the Simpsons and friends and Seinfeld and Michael Jordan and Monica Lewinsky and Kiss and rap music. A good breakfast was a bowl of some kind of sugar-colored cereal or some kind of colored cereal like Trix. And beginning in the 90s, kids were able to record their favorite TV shows on something called VHS. And if your parents got it wrong, beta. <clears throat> and they could watch it later. Home computers were available for households that could afford one back then. There were these great big monstrosities from Radio Shack. And it was a miracle, those little computers, because you could store all of your data on these things called floppy disk. And it might take three or four floppy disks just to store one little set of data <laughs> back then. But life began to change drastically for kids in the th 2000s. The feeling of safety disappeared with 9-11. They were thrown into the war of terror. Escape came in the form of American Idol. Harry Potter, and South Park, MySpace, and a sweet little girl back then named uh, Hannah Montana. Now she's Miley Cyrus, which she was then too. But. And we were introduced to smartphones. And with the introduction of smartphones, kids were introduced to pornography and the internet and all kinds of social media, and it was right there at their fingertips. Since the 2000s, kids have spent less time building real relationships and more time building social relationships on their telephones. And Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and YouTube. And now once innocent kids are now sexting on their smartphones. In school they were taught Susie had two mothers. They were handed out condoms. They were encouraged to engage in sexual activity, even homosexual activity. And parents were no longer notified should their daughters decide to have an abortion. It took a, right, a lot of the rights away from the parents. And gay marriage became a thing, and abortion became a means of birth control. And absence was looked down upon, frowned upon. And responsibility for one's actions were no longer taught or accepted. And kids weren't encouraged to excel, they weren't encouraged to practice, they weren't encouraged to achieve or to conquer, or to overcome, or be victorious. Instead, every kid was given a participation trophy so that nobody would get their feelings hurt, and so that nobody would be offended. And homes no longer were safe havens as neighborhoods became, became uh, plagued by drugs and drive-by shootings. Kids today, they see more, they know more, and they experience more, and they grow up so much faster than when we were kids. And they're exposed to drugs and sex before they're even 10 years old. 
and sex talk is nothing to them because they hear it every day. So my question is, where was the church in all of this? Where was the church in all of this? And why has the church remained so silent over these past 30 and 40 years? Where was the church allowing our homes and our neighborhoods almost to go to hell? Where was the church? An entire generation has been lost to the world that we live in today. An entire generation doesn't even believe there is a God today. They question a God. They question our belief in God. They don't see a need for the church any longer. They don't see value in the sanctity of a husband and a wife relationship any longer. And kids today don't understand how all these things contribute to God's blessing of a home and of a family. This is what Dr. James Dobson says. He says, we must make the salvation of our children our number one priority. <coughs> Nothing else is more important. Hope you agree with that. Amen. Because he's right. There was a mighty man of of God in the Bible. We need to pass out some Bibles over here. <coughs> I want everyone to get one of the Bibles. We're going to be looking at Joshua 24. It was a mighty man of God who felt the same way that our children, the safety and the care of our children is one of our most important responsibilities. So we need to, uh, let's look at what Joshua said. So, <coughs> Pass out some Bibles, or if you brought your own, let's turn in our Bible to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. Now remember, Joshua was leading the, the people of Israel at the time. It was after Moses had died, and this was just before Joshua himself was about to die. So before he died, he summoned all the tribes of Israel to come together. He wanted to speak to all the leaders of Israel. And the first 13 verses in Joshua 24, he is reminding the leaders of all of the things that God had done for the people of Israel. And Joshua is basically recounting the story of the conquest that they had gone through to receive the promised land and all of the promises that God had kept in doing so. So, if you will, we're going to start by reading verse 11. I'll read it to you. Everybody got it? It says, When you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you. Like I said, he's reminding them. As did the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, I guess. Jebusites, that's right. But I gave you victory over them, and I sent terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your swords or bows that brought you victory. I gave you land you had not worked on, and I gave you towns that you did not build. The towns where you are now living. I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. So Joshua wanted to make sure that the leaders did not forget all of the things that God had done for them. And they owed everything to God. There was nothing they achieved or acquired on their own. It was given to them by God. 
And the Israelite army had won every battle. And Joshua knew that it would be natural for them if they did not give tribute to God and recognition to God, that they would start thinking, hey, we're something special. You know, we're invincible. And that would be deadly because they know that if they took credit for what God had done, God is going to turn their back on them and they would be suffering consequences. So as mothers and as fathers and stepmothers and stepfathers and grandmothers and grandfathers, I think we should do with our families exactly what Joshua did with these leaders of Israel. We need to remember the things that God has done in our families. We need to remember all the things that God has done for us. And one way to do that is we need to keep records of God's faithfulness in our life. How many people here keep a journal? We need to keep journals because journals help us remember. It helps us remember what God is doing in his faithfulness. It's a record of the blessings that he pours out on our family. For example, we need to be able to look at those records, those journals, we can come back to our children and we can say, uh, sweetheart, do you remember when we were sick? You were sick. You didn't think you'd ever get well and we prayed for you and God made you better. You remember when daddy lost his job? And we didn't know how we were going to be able to pay our bills. And we were afraid and we were fearful. So we prayed, and God gave Daddy a new job. Do we remember when we prayed for Uncle Joe and Aunt Cheryl that they might be saved? That they would come to know Jesus the way that we know Jesus. Do you remember when we prayed for them? And how six months later they came to know Jesus? You know, a good memory of what God is doing in our lives and in our family's life will keep us from backsliding. It'll keep us from turning our backs to Jesus. So we need to write it down. And we need to write it down often and we need to remind our children of what God is doing. So back to Joshua 24. We're picking up at verse 14. It's, and this is Joshua. He's challenging the people of Israel, the leaders of Israel to be faithful to God. It says, So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now, whose land you now live? So Joshua is telling them, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. We should be teaching our children our families, you know, as parents and grandparents, we should be teaching them to fear the Lord. Now, fear the Lord doesn't mean that you're afraid of God. Fear the Lord is that you have the utmost respect for His power and His love, and you're going to want to do everything that you can to please Him in everything that you do. Fear the Lord means we honor God in everything that we do. So how do we encourage our families to fear God? How do we encourage our families to honor God? Well, we do so as mothers and fathers and grandparents by setting the example. We set the example 
They see God through us. They see our faith in what we say and in our actions. Because when the parents truly fear the Lord, the children will fear the Lord also. And when the parents love the Lord, their parent, the children will love the Lord also. And when they sing praises to the Lord, the kids will start singing praises to the Lord. When you're praying to the Lord, the kids will be praying to the Lord. Walk into the bedroom, you can see the children on the bed praying for something. Because they saw your example. Now I feel like I'm a poor example of what I'm going to say, but this is to the men who are here today. The fathers. The men. The fathers. We bear a heavy responsibility in setting a good example. We bear a heavy responsibility. Like Joshua, we bear a mighty responsibility in setting the example of how we should be living. And I'm speaking to the men and the stepdads and the granddads and the uncles. You know, for too many years, men have kind of delegated this spiritual leadership to the women. It was the wives, the mothers that set the example Sunday mornings you would see the mother taking the children off to church and the father would stay home or have to cut the grass or chores to do. And we've given this burden to the women and God never intended that our wives and our mothers carry this burden alone. God meant that this spiritual burden be a shared burden shared by both the mothers and the fathers. But we as men should set the example. And according to Joshua's example, our entire family should be obedient and honor God. So let's continue reading at verse 14. It says, So fear the Lord and serve Him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. Joshua wants his people, he wants his family to willingly serve God. To serve the Lord alone. And he says to serve Him wholeheartedly. That means with all of your heart. Some versions that you may be reading, it says to serve him in all faithfulness. So our entire family should be serving the Lord in whole faithfulness, which means in every area of our life. As we continue reading in verse 15, Joshua tells us that we should remember our spiritual heritage. That's why we need to keep those journals Remembering our spiritual heritage is something that this nation needs to spend more time doing. So let's read. It says, But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. He's calling all of his leaders together before he dies. And he says, Choose today who you will serve. Are you going to serve one of these gods of our ancestors? pagan gods, these idols, these false gods. He says, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Amen. So Joshua is saying we've got to make a choice. We've got to make a choice. You can choose to serve the true God where you can go and worship the God on the, river, on the other side of the river Euphrates or the God that the Amorites worship. You know, the moon God or the sun God or the river God or the fertility God or the sexual pleasure God. Joshua is telling them that they've got to make a choice. Who will you serve? If you're not going to serve 
the Lord, then separate yourself from the Lord and go and worship the God of your ancestors. You know, since that time, since the days of Joshua, there's many, many people that continue to serve the gods of this world and not the true God. They're not serving the God of the Bible. They're serving the gods of the flesh. You know, some people would just rather drink from a cesspool of sin than to drink that holy river from the river of God, the water of life. But here's what you need to know. We cannot force people to love God. We cannot force people to serve God. It's a choice. And that's what Joshua is telling them. It's a choice. You've got to decide on your own who you will serve. That's their choice. But as for me and my family, we are going to serve the Lord. That's the will of God. The will of God is that we serve Him and that our entire family serve Him. So as fathers and as the mothers here and the grandmothers and grandfathers and step-parents, we've got to set the example. We've got to show them in our actions, in our belief, and in our faith that we honor God and that we serve God. We do everything in our power to honor Him. And we do everything in our power to set the example to our children. So that, like our joint scripture reading that we read this morning, that they will grow up to honor God also. But it's a choice. And I can't choose it for you. And you can't choose for me. We have to make our own choices. So as parents and grandparents, we have an obligation to set the example. And as fathers, as the men, we have that highest responsibility, I think, in setting the example. It's our children look up to the fathers. What is our father going to do? In the world that we're living in today, there's a lot of children that do not have fathers in their homes. They're growing up in fatherless homes. The fathers have disappeared. You know, what kind of example is that? But then you've got fathers and grandfathers and uncles that are picking up that mantle and they're setting the example that they want their children and their nephews and their nieces to see. So I want to urge you, you know, the grandparents and the parents and the step-parents, that you need to invest heavily in your children and your grandchildren and your stepchildren because you have more influence than you can even imagine that you do in molding and developing their belief and their faith system. So as Joshua declares, but as for me, so what Joshua is basically saying here is, I don't care what the rest of you are going to do, but as for me and as for my family, we are going to worship the Lord. Amen. We are going to serve the Lord. So Joshua is the leader of the nation of Israel. But Joshua was at that point ready to separate himself from all of those people in that nation that he is leading who are not going to serve the Lord, who are not going to make the choice that the Lord is their true God. And we've got to learn how to do that in our own relationships sooner or later. So whether you're in a relationship with a co-worker or a friend or a family member or a neighbor and you're following the Lord, there's going to come a time when you've just got to say you got to do what you want. And whatever you do, I will still be your friend. But as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. That doesn't mean you give up praying for them 
That doesn't mean you give up setting the example for them. It just comes a point where they have made a choice and you turn everything over to the Holy Spirit. Because it's a decision they have to make. It's a choice. I can't make it for you. You've got to make it on your own. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Who are you going to serve? Well, you can serve the devil or you can serve the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. So this is an important question, especially for the parents here today. And Joshua is speaking to the leaders. And the fathers are the head of the family. We've got to set the example. Joshua, he claims the right. He says, when me and my family are going to serve the Lord, Joshua is claiming the right to speak for his entire family. You know, I just said you can't make them. But he's making the choice to speak for his wife. He's speaking for his children. He's speaking for his grandchildren. Joshua is speaking for his great-grandchildren. He says, even my servants are going to serve the Lord because Joshua is going to set that example and Joshua has that kind of a relationship with each member of his family, his children, and he spends time with them that he knows their hearts. He knows their hearts. So he can say, as far as my family is concerned, we are going to serve the Lord. You know, every Christian should set that example same example, we should be able to say as far as my family is concerned, we're going to serve the Lord. And this is more than a statement of forsaking other gods and not believing other gods and not believing the gods of this world. It states how we're going to live our life. What we're going to believe in. And who are we going to trust so how can Joshua be so certain about his family? Well, like I said, he knew his family. He had fed his family spiritual beliefs and faith and trust and blessings his entire life. He set the example, and he knew what they believed because he prepared his children to believe that. You've got to serve somebody. Now, can I guarantee that my children and grandchildren are going to follow my steps and my example? No, I can't. But I know that if I set the example and I know their hearts, I can say who is and who I need to pray more for. And unfortunately, we all have cases in our families of people who do not serve the Lord. And we need to continue to pray for them. And we need to continue to set an example for them. And every time they see our actions and what we believe in and the fact that you know we, we can control our fear, we can direct our prayers, they're going to see that we live a life different than they do because we're setting the example. So, if you set the example, if you're a godly parent, that means you're able to tip the scales in the right direction so that your children are going to follow God. If you don't set the example, they're going to choose, but without having an example, they're probably going to make the wrong choice. Now, Dr. James Dobbs, and I mentioned the phrase from him earlier, he gives 10 traits that can help us be more successful as Christian parents. I want to read these to you. He's got an entire book on it, but I just want to kind of give the highlights of these 10 traits. Number one, he says, we need to teach your children early and often when it comes to the gospel message. Hope you're doing that. 
Number two, it says, instill in your children that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. They're made by a God that loves them and a God that has a special purpose for them in their lives. So we need to let them know that their self-esteem is not something that they derive from what other people think of them. Their self-esteem is derived by what God thinks of them. Like I said, they're fearfully and wonderfully made. Number three, we need to be a student of your child's heart. You need to know your children. You need to get to know their special gifts and their special talents and their special passions. Children can do miraculous things because they have the gifts that so many of us maybe are longing for as we become adults. And as parents, we need to give opportunities for our children to be able to expand and excel in these gifts. Number four, dedicate time each day to acknowledge God in your life. Because there's joy. There's joy in walking with Christ every day. And it's part not only of developing a relationship with Him, but having our children also develop a relationship with Him. It's a relationship. It's not a religion. Amen. Number five, raise your sons and daughters to become godly men and women. Because childhood is a journey. The world they live in today, they've kind of been stripped of their childhood. You know, once they get out of kindergarten, they're like thrown into adulthood. And they're not mature enough. They're not ready for it. The evil of this world is just going to pounce on them if you're not setting the example. God distinctly made your children either male or female. And as parents, it's our calling to teach them and to model and to grow them within the boundaries of their God-ordained sex. I know there's... A lot of things, there's like 51 sexes now, according to some people. Number six, never let your anger drive you. You know, all disciplinary measures should be done out of love, not out of anger. You're representing Jesus. You're representing the Father. He's the Father of love. You do things to discipline your children out of love, out of correcting them out of love putting them on in, into the right direction out of love, out of caring for them. Number seven, allow your household to be a refuge where mercy and grace are practiced every day. Mercy and grace are practiced every day. You know, sometimes our kids can really get on our nerves. But we've got to have mercy and grace. They're kids. They're growing up. They're going to challenge you. You've got to set the example. You've got to be forgiving. You've got to be loving, even though, hey, they don't need to be loved today. They haven't deserved it. But you've got to love them anyway. You've got to care for them anyway. So our children should not forget that mercy and grace is something that's afforded to us by God. Mercy and grace is afforded to us by God and is saturated on us by the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> It was His grace and His mercy. Number eight, laugh and enjoy life and uplift others. Have a good time with your children. Follow Christ's examples and be there when other people are in need. A lot of times we turn our backs when family members are in need. We need to be there for them. We need to enjoy life together. Number nine, encourage children to desire and value hard work. You know, put in the effort that they need to do to excel and to be overcomers. To be victorious in their life. To develop and enhance their skills and gifts that God has given them. Let them grow in those gifts. So we need to teach responsibility. If they learn responsibility, they can become a godly adult also. And finally, always reinforce that our greatest life goal 
is to glorify God in everything that we do because that is our purpose, to glorify God. We were created to glorify God and to serve Him. And as for me and my family, we are going to serve Him. So are you ready to serve the Lord? Are you ready to set the example to serve the Lord? In the words of Bob Dylan, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody because there's no middle road. You're either going to choose the God of this world or you're going to choose the God of the Bible. Every person must choose somebody. I can't choose for you. I can't choose for my children, but I can set the example and I can let them see that I'm serving the Lord in everything that I do. And I'm praying and I'm believing and I'm trusting in the Lord. You've got to choose somebody. You've got to make a choice. You've got to decide. But then as far as I'm concerned, I've decided. And I hope